The following is a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. Coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents... Does God know whether or not you're going to be saved? But does that mean He's making it happen? For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Everlasting Gospel video series. Uh, the message is a message about salvation. There are a lot of misconceptions about what constitutes salvation. How many of you have heard of the phrase predestination? Maybe you've heard the phrase once saved, always saved, or election. There are a lot of very dear Christians that under misunderstand the fundamentals of how we're saved, and not understanding that can be lethal. Now, it's probably a good idea to start at the beginning of what is it that constitutes salvation? Why did Jesus come? We need to be saved from our past record of sins. We need to be saved from the present power of sin. And ultimately, we are hoping to be saved from the presence of sin. So it's the record of sin, the power of sin, and the presence of sin. So you might even say it, the penalty of sin, power of sin, the presence of sin. Justification, you've heard these big words before, sanctification, glorification. Many Christians have left off the sanctification part of salvation. They think that salvation is just the Lord coming by and tossing them a life jacket and saying someday the water will go down and you can walk to the hotel yourself. This is, in my opinion, what a lot of Christians believe. That God doesn't save us from the power of sin in our lives. He just saves us from the guilty feeling so we can breathe a little longer. Tosses us a life jacket. Now, some of this begins with an individual named John Calvin. And I need to be very respectful because this was a giant in the Christian Reformation. A real man of faith. Uh, when I read Calvin, he is very deep. Obviously knew the Lord. Tremendous Bible student. Brilliant scholar. But like all men, Calvin, Luther, Wesley, they weren't all perfect. They were human. And Calvin, wanting, he was very organized and he wanted to systematize everything. And he tried to systematize salvation and he developed something that's now known as Calvinism. There are five points that Calvin came up with. I held up four fingers and said five points. There are five points that Calvin came up with. And these are what they are, dealing with the doctrine of predestination. One, the total depravity of man. We're all born sinners. Well, we agree that we are all born with this propensity to sin. We're born with these selfish natures that Adam uh, received through the fall. Two, unconditional election. God has already chosen who's going to be saved. Now, this is where I respectfully disagree. Do we all agree that God knows who's going to be saved right now? Does that mean that He chose arbitrarily or that He knows what we will choose? Big difference. Point three, limited atonement. Jesus died only to redeem those who are pre-chosen or the elect. That's a dangerous teaching, I believe. Point four, irresistible grace. These are the titles that Calvin gave it. That man is saved by God's will without any choice on our part. I respectfully disagree. But these teachings have influenced much of Christianity. And then point number five, perseverance of the saints. Those who are predestined to be saved cannot be lost, okay, even by their choice. Once you're saved, you're saved. The perseverance of the saints. And part of the reason for this argument is Calvin and those who embrace these teachings, they say that if you and I have any part in our salvation, then God doesn't get all the glory. So if you say, well, I did make the choice, then you get some of the credit, so you don't even have a choice. Did you catch what I'm saying? 
They say that any part that you play by your choice means you get credit. So you really don't have a choice. If God's already chosen you to be saved, you'll be saved. And if not, then he has chosen you for damnation. And that's his choice. It's the sovereignty of God. Have you heard these phrases before? He gets to choose who's saved and who's lost. And I've had people before who are raised in these church environments and I've heard them say they're, they're not following the Lord and they say, well, you know, my pastor said as I was growing up, God's decided who's saved and I figure if I'm saved, he'll save me and that'll be his business. And they make no effort to seek after God in spite of all the scriptures that tell us that we do have a role to play in seeking after God. Why would Jesus command us to seek and find if you don't really need to choose to seek? Seems easier to say, once I'm saved, no matter what I do, I can't be lost. But is that what the Bible teaches? I want to go with what Jesus says. How about you? Paul says, Romans 8, 29, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Who he called, these he justified. And who he justified, these he glorified. Now some have said, well, see, God's predestined who's saved, and those are the ones that he's going to sanctify. And if you're not predestined by God, then you're just doomed. That's not what Paul's saying. God wants everyone to be saved. Those who respond to the invitation, he then transforms. You know, actually, the contemporary English version is one place where it translates it more accurately. Let me read this. Romans 8, 29 from the contemporary English version. And he has always known who his chosen ones would be. He has decided to let them become like his own son, that his son would be the first among many children. See, that's easier to understand. God is all-knowing, and because God is all-knowing, he knows whether or not you're going to be saved. I know you'd like him to give you the word right now, right? Does God know whether or not you're going to be saved? But does that mean he's making it happen? Well, he certainly is making it available. But whether or not you're saved, it's your choice. Why else does the Bible say, choose ye who you will serve if you have no choice? It's a terrible teaching that we don't have a choice. Granted, the grace of God does intervene in our lives. He tries to get our attention. And as we respond through our lives to the providence of God, I believe he intervenes more. But we have a choice. Some are saying, well, wait a second, Doug. What about that verse where the Bible says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart? Doesn't that mean that God looks down and says, you know, I need to demonstrate something here, and so I'm going to have to harden his heart and make him stubborn so that I could teach my lessons. And yeah, he'll be lost, but you know, after all, he's expendable. And they read that verse there in Exodus 4.21, Pharaoh's hard heart. When you go back to Egypt, Moses, see that you do those wonders before Pharaoh that I put in your hand, but I'll harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. There it is, Doug. It says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, you might think that by itself, but you need to read the other verses. There are several other verses, like Exodus 18, verse 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief from one of the plagues, Pharaoh hardened his heart and did not heed, as the Lord had said. How come it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart? Well, you have to understand the way that the Hebrew mind works. God would send circumstances. Pharaoh would respond to the circumstances with pride. So God is saying, through my circumstances, Pharaoh's heart will be hardened instead of softening. For instance, you could have on the ground here a lump of clay and a lump of wax. The sun, the same sun, could shine on those two lumps. One will get hard and one will melt. The sun is the same. The substance is different. In the same way that the tragedies harden the hearts of some, others' hearts are softened. Pharaoh decided to respond with pride to those things instead of humility. And so God says, you know, I hardened his heart through the circumstances I sent. But Pharaoh chose to respond the way he chose. So don't think that God is up there like one of these ancient Greek gods looking down on people like we're little chess pieces and going, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, I'll save you. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, I'll save you. You know why that's a dangerous thing to believe? That makes God an accessory to sin. For God to say, I think that I am going to just choose that you should be lost for eternity, well, that not only makes him an accessory to sin, that he would support sin. Instead of saving you from your sin, he said, I'm going to let you keep sinning. Isn't that what it's tantamount to? 
it also distorts his love. What kind of God would say, well, I think that, you know, for whatever reason, I'm going to save you, but, you know, I just need to make an example of some people, so you're lost. And yet, this is what predestination teaches. It's a distortion of the character of God. Oh, but Doug, what about that verse? Romans chapter 9, verse 13. Turn with me. This is terribly misunderstood. I've loved Jacob and I hated Esau. You ever heard that? I love Jacob and I hated Esau. There you have it. They're twins. And he says, you know, I think I'm going to love this one. I'll save him and I'm going to destroy this one. Romans 9, 13. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Oh, by the way, Paul wrote that. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he said to Moses, I'll have mercy on whomever I'll have mercy. I'll have compassion on whoever I'll have compassion on. All right, first thing I want to deal with is the Esau-Jacob business. Paul is quoting the Old Testament. When a New Testament writer is quoting the Old Testament, if you want to understand the verse, you've got to go back to who he's quoting. Listen to what he says in Malachi chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Last book in the Old Testament. But Esau I've hated and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness, even though Edom, Edom were the descendants of Esau, even though Edom uh, has said, we have been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I'll throw down. In other words, I've loved Jacob, I've hated Esau. What does that mean? It has nothing to do with the individuals, it has to do with the nations that came out of them. So when God says, I've loved Jacob, he means I decided to choose the Israelites and make them the recipients of the oracles of God, the Bible. And I did not choose Esau or the Edomites, his descendants. He's talking about nations, not individuals. Why did he say, I've chosen the Israelites and not the Edomites? Because of the way the fathers chose. Because Jacob said, I want the spiritual blessing and Esau was willing to sell his blessing for a pot of beans because Esau was carnal and Jacob was spiritual. God said, because of the choice of the fathers, I am going to choose Israel to make them the recipients of the covenant and I'm not going to choose Esau, the Edomites. He's not talking about individuals. He's talking about nations. Do you see that in what it said here in Malachi? And yet people, because they don't know their Bibles and they don't read the reference, they say, oh, God's just up there saying, twins, saved, lost. I love you, I hate you. What parent would do that with their twins, even if one was hairy and one was smooth? I mean, you still love them both, right? Romans 9. Oh, wait, I wanted to get to the second part of this. What should we say then? Is God unfair? He said, I'll have mercy on whomever I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. How many of you remember a parable that Jesus told about a man who goes into the marketplace and he's trying to find workers for his vineyard? And he goes several times during the day. And he goes early and he gets a few and they start working. He says, I'll give you a penny a day. Then he goes later and he finds some. He says, come and I'll pay you what's fair. And he finds some others later. Finally, at the end of the day, the 11th hour, you've heard that expression, he gets more workers for his vineyard. Every time he goes to the marketplace, he's saying, who wants to work in my vineyard? Anybody can come. Isn't that what he's saying? And he keeps, his, his problem is not that he's being selective. His problem is he can't get enough workers. Anybody's invited. You got that? At the end of the day, he starts with those who have worked just one hour, and he says, here, I'm paying you a full day's wage. Well, those who have worked all day long, they say, oh, hey, he's getting full day's wage. We'll probably get ten times that. They get the same thing. And they say, hey, no fair. Why are you doing this? And God says, I'll show mercy in whom I want to show mercy. They've all been saved, but he is showing extra grace to some. It's not that God is being unfair in a negative sense. He's being unfair in a positive sense. He's being too good. So when the Bible talks about God is showing mercy to who he wants to show, he's going the extra mile. He's being extra kind. The only way you ever find God being unfair in the Bible is when he's too fair. Did you get that? That's the times when the Bible writers are saying God is showing extra mercy. He's inviting everybody. But let's admit it, God does show extra mercy for some. But what is it? Is he not paying those who came and worked all day long? Is he not paying them fairly? No, he says, I'm giving you what I promised. You've been called, you've been saved. I'm, pro I'm paying what I promised you. But I've decided to be extra nice to some. That's a whole different thing than for him saying, I'm going to be extra nice to you and save you, but you're not going to get paid at all. See the difference? 
And Calvin and those that follow, they get a distorted view of this. Conditions for security. John 10, verse 27. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they'll never perish. Neither will any man pluck them out of my hand. That was one of the verses. Again, John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Will not be plucked out of my hand. I will not cast out. Now, is the Lord there saying that you don't have freedom? Or is he saying, I can be trusted? If God is forcing you to stay with him, then it's not love anymore, is it? What is forced love? There's a word for it. It's called rape. You can't force somebody to love you. God is saying, you can trust me that I made a promise. I won't break my promise. But what about us? Can we choose to go away? And many do. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 to 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you've been washed. See, it's very clear. Just because you say, well, once I'm saved, I can't be lost, that's and you can go live like the devil. That's not what the Bible teaches. Can a computer love? Love must be a choice. We choose to love God. See, if God arbitrarily decides who the elect are, who's predestined, and says, I'm going to wire this one so they're saved, and I'm not going to wire this one. It's like a factory that is deliberately putting out defective material. Isn't that what it would amount to? If God is in advance deciding that he's going to poorly wire some of our computers so that we're all prone to sin and we can't be saved, he becomes an accomplice. But actually the problem is we're all badly wired. And he is going in and saving as many as will come to him. Whoever comes to me, I will not cast out. Does that mean you have a choice? Yes. You can choose to come to him. Once saved, always saved. Is that true? You remember the parable that Jesus told about the sower who went out to sow? Some of the seed falls on the stony ground. It falls on the rock. In Luke 8, 13, it says, Then those on the rock, when they hear the word, they receive the word with joy, but they don't have any root in themselves. So they believe for a while, but when temptation comes, they fall away. Now here's the question. Once you are saved, can you fall away? I believe the Bible teaches you can. First of all, it says these seeds, they sprouted. They believed. They received it with joy. They did everything that they could do to receive the word and to be saved. Can you leave New York if you've never been in New York? Can you? Can you fall away from salvation if you're not saved? So if the Bible teaches that some can fall away, then that must mean that once a person's saved, there is risk. That we need, that's why we're challenged so many times in the Bible to keep focused on the Lord, to stay close to God, to abide in Him. Are there examples in the Bible of people that were called, that followed the Lord, they were spirit-filled, and then they fell away? King Saul. Who chose Saul as king? An election? Or did God choose him? Did God choose him to make an example of him so he'd be lost? No, he chose him because he was the choice of God. Was he spirit-filled? Yeah, it says another spirit came upon him. And for a while there, he was very loyal. He even is called a prophet in the Bible, if you've read the whole story. But he began to cherish pride. And eventually, he grieved away the Holy Spirit. He fell away. Balaam was a prophet of God, but he loved money. And even though he said in his prayer, oh, let my lot be like theirs, he went running after filthy lucre, and he perished with the ungodly. Judas was one of the twelve. When Jesus sent them out and they went out preaching and they came back and said, even the devils are subject to us, was Judas one of those apostles that came back with a successful evangelistic experience? He was. I mean, this idea that you may have in your mind that Judas was always going around rubbing his hands like snidely whiplash and twisting the wax in his mustache and trying to steal money all the time, you probably would have voted him into position in the church. He was a nice guy. But in his heart, something wasn't right. I believe that there was a time when Judas had the Holy Spirit working in his heart. But he fell. And so 
the Bible tells us that these stories are in the Bible as a warning. Now, what does it mean to be elected? You know, the Bible talks about those that are chosen, those that are elected. Predestination is also called eternal election. I heard one minister put it this way. It simply means that God has cast his vote for you, the devil has cast his vote against you, and you have the tie-breaking vote. You do have a choice. Many are called, few are chosen. What is election? God has called many. What does that mean? Everybody, whosoever will. Those who respond to the invitation are then elected. Many are called, few are chosen. The ones who respond are chosen. They're the ones who are predestined. Whoever responds to the call. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 4, in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. Is it possible for those who are once in the faith to depart? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And by the way, as much as I respect many things Calvin taught, this particular doctrine is a doctrine of devils because it gives people a false sense of security. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 2, Paul by which you were also saved if you hold fast to that word that I preached to you. Unless you believed in vain. He says, you're saved if you hold fast. We must choose to hang on. And again, John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in the Lord ought to walk as he walked. Can people fall from salvation? I'm kind of jumping around here a little bit. Paul said, Paul did not even consider himself exempt. And keep in mind, this is the same Paul that said, I know whom I believed in and I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. I know who I believe. But Paul said, but I keep my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I should be a castaway. Paul recognized I need to be careful or I could be cast away. That's the Apostle Paul, writer of the New Testament. Did he realize he needed to be on his guard? Doesn't the Bible say whoever thinks he stands, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Take heed lest he fall. Whoever thinks he stands. Everybody needs to be careful because anybody can fall. Peter said, Lord, though all men forsake you, I'll not forsake you. Did he fall? Yeah, it's a dangerous thinking. Hebrews 10, 38. Now the just will live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul will not have pleasure on him. Is it possible for us to draw back? 2 Peter 2, 20 and 21. For if after they've escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, they are again entangled therein, or don't miss this, friends, is it possible for people who have once escaped the world, they know the Lord and the Savior, they get entangled in the world again and are overcome. The latter end for them is worse than the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. These are saved people. Then after they known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. And you know the part about the dog and the pig. I'm not going to read that. Paul talks about Demas, whose name was written in the book of life, who followed me. And what does Paul later say happened to Demas? 2 Timothy 4, verse 10. Demas has forsaken me, having loved the present world. He was one of his fellow laborers. So this teaching that once you're saved, you can't be lost, you can't fall away, that God just saves you from the penalty of sin, that's not biblical. God wants to save us from the penalty. He wants to save us from the power. And ultimately, he's going to save us from the presence. He's not just throwing us a life jacket. What he's wanting to do is get us out of the swamp, right? Stay tuned. Pastor Doug will be right back with this week's special free offer. Hello, friends. The program you're watching is the culmination of a dream and a mission. Let me tell you about the mission. Amazing Facts believes strongly in the great commission given by Christ in Matthew chapter 28 to share the wonderful news of salvation with the entire world. There are billions of people on this planet that are in desperate need of a change in their lives. We believe that a spiritual encounter with God is the only way to effect real change. Now let me tell you about the dream. Amazing Facts started in 1966 after the founder of this ministry, Joe Cruz, decided to take the mission of sharing God's Word with everyone personally. Since then, we have shared this wonderful message about God with millions around the world through our free Bible school, free Bible study guides, our television, radio, and internet ministries. During Pastor Doug Batchelor's 10-day health and gospel mission trip to Southeast India, 
we witnessed over 15,000 individuals surrender their lives over to Christ. We are currently building 70 churches in that region. If you've been blessed by this program and would like to join with us in this mission of taking the gospel to the world, why not call to become a partner in evangelism? Our partners have decided to consistently contribute to our efforts in sharing this message that has changed not only my life, but the lives of countless others. If you'd like to join our partners, share a testimony or contribute a gift, contact us today. Friends, the most amazing fact of all is that God loves us and cares for us and that He has a plan for your life. Prayerfully consider joining our efforts. Until next time, may God continue to hold you in the palm of His hand. World events have never been more unstable than today. Terrorism, disasters, bizarre weather. What does the Bible reveal about future events? Learn the amazing answer in this stunning 43-minute documentary entitled The Final Events of Bible Prophecy. During this special broadcast, you can get your very own copy of this gripping DVD free. You pay only $6.95 for shipping and handling. Go to the phone and call the number on your screen. Don't miss out on this special offer. Some of the most beautiful songs and music have come from people who are writing from a broken heart. Somebody once said, the richest fragrance comes from the crushed flower. You're never too little for God to use, but you could be too much for God to use. Suicide is the result of someone who's lost hope, they've lost faith, and then the last act is murder of themselves. Friends, if there is any subject in God's Word you want to be sure to clearly understand, it's how to be saved. In the Bible, you'll find the amazing story of God's plan of redemption and how even now you can look forward to a place with Him in paradise. It's true. Jesus made a profound sacrifice to provide you with everlasting life. You owe it to yourself to understand what you must do to be saved. We'd like to help you embrace this wonderful offer of life. So we prepared a special booklet we'd like to send you for free. It's entitled, Assurance, Justification Made Simple. In it, we clearly outline the simple plan of salvation. And it's yours free when you call the toll-free number on your screen. Ask for offer number 727. Or write us at Amazing Facts, offer number 727, P.O. Box 1058, Roseville, California, 95678. Well, that's all the time we have for today's broadcast. Until next time, remember the words of Jesus. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is your last chance to take advantage of this week's special free offer. There is no cost or obligation. Just call the toll-free number on your screen, and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. The preceding was a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated.